Good evening, everyone out there in the Northeastern District and beyond. Welcome to another NED CDD webinar. My name is Eric Ruthenberg. I'll be your host for the evening. I'm uh, glad to see you all out there in cyberspace. Welcome back. Good to see a bunch of friendly faces out there. And those of you tuning in after the fact on YouTube, we appreciate your, your coming on and, uh, and checking it out. Please be sure to leave some comments for us after and let us know what you thought. Um, so, first some news before I introduce our guest this evening. I uh, always like to bring folks up to speed here in the NED with our course director stuff. Make sure you're registered for the convention, which is coming up soon. I think the, the deadline for the CJ20 has passed, but you can still register for the convention. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, our, our headquarters hotel is sold out, but uh, I'm sure you can still get uh, someplace good if you act now. So there's the website if you want to go and uh, do that. Uh, as you may or may not know, all our web webinar archives are on the district website, anydistrict.org slash directors. You can see every single one we've ever done and get all caught up. If you, uh, for some reason, missed one and you want to you wanna catch up after the fact, there they are. And this will be posted uh, later this evening. Uh, if uh, you recall last year, I put together a, a list of NEDAC uh, members, the Northeastern District Association of Champions, uh, quartet guys who would be willing to come coach your chorus for uh, for voice things, for singing things. Maybe you don't have uh, uh, singing is not something that's in your tool set or teaching singing, I should say. Uh, and maybe you want someone to come and, and help with some vocal stuff, some specific vocal things you've been working on. Uh, I've got a list of 10 or 12 uh, NEDAC singers who would be happy to come and coach your chorus for just expenses, just for travel to get there and back. Um, so let me know if you want to see that list. I'll be happy to send you that link and you can contact any of those guys in your area. Uh, be sure to uh, keep your January, first week in January open for the Leadership Academy. We have Joe Cerruti coming to do our uh, director's track at Leadership Academy in January. We're going to do uh, sort of like we've done in the past. We've done the morning of some one-on-one -on -one, uh, conducting lessons and some, some talk about uh, director and uh, directing issues. Uh, and then in the afternoon, we all prepare a song ahead of time. And Joe is going to be the director, and we will be in on a Joe Cerruti rehearsal and see what that's like and uh, be a mock rehearsal. So you get to be the chorus for a change, and uh, we'll see how Joe does things. So it'll be a blast. That's the first weekend in January in beautiful downtown Worcester. I hear Worcester's lovely in January. Pause for laughter. Okay. Uh, thank you. <laughs> And if, uh, if you have not yet done a CDWI, a Chorus Director's Workshop Intensive, or even if you have and you want to do another one, please reach out to me. I would love to know where you are and, and uh, how to get one going in your area, because that is uh, one of our best tools here in, the, uh, here, in, here in Barbershop. We get to be with you for an entire day and do director training with you, basically one-on-one. -on -one. We have two trainers come in and work with you and, and uh, three or four of your colleagues all day. Uh, and it's, it's not only is it a blast, but you learn a ton. Uh, I've done a couple myself as a student, and I've, I've helped present a few. And they, each one is different and, and amazing in their own way. So I hope you will reach out to me and tell me you are interested in doing a CDWI, because they are just a blast. OK. Sorry. Sorry. Can anybody uh, monitor that? You know, like Can any anybody monitor? So, so the morning is really set aside. That's a great question. I get that uh, quite a bit. The morning is really set aside for uh, uh, the the brain trust, if you will, the, the four or five directors and the two trainers to sit and do some really deep dive uh, philosophical conversation about why you're a director, why do you do this, and what kinds of things do you see in your guys when it's a great night and maybe identify some things that get in the way of it being a great night from week to week. And from there, they determine what they want to work on in the afternoon. So as, as awesome as that conversation is, it's really set aside for those directors to really do some deep soul searching uh, and bond with each other. Uh, but the afternoon where the chorus comes in and is the lab chorus, absolutely anybody can come and sing or watch or, or videotape or whatever. Um, because that that's a blast, and and the singers walk away with just as much, if not more, than the directors do. Cool. Okay. Thanks. Cool. 
So our guest speaker for this evening is my friend Gary Plagg. There is his email address if you don't have it yet. He is a certified presentation, I mean, per, per, performance judge. And uh, he's also the president of and CEO of Coraggio Consulting, where he teaches people to uh, be better public speakers and, and, and helps them with uh, things like overcoming uh, stage fright and things like that for a living. So Gary is a, is a great person and a great uh, resource for our performance category. Uh, and I can't wait to hear what Gary has to say. He was one of uh, four performance judges at Harmony U who presented to the student body about the new performance category uh, and he's here to share some uh, some news with us and tell us as directors what uh, what kinds of things we should be looking out for what might we be doing differently teaching differently saying differently uh, and things like that so I'm going to turn it over to Gary for a little bit and uh, then we'll ab absolutely entertain questions throughout the evening uh, raise your hand or yell in the chat window and uh, I'll be able to monitor that and away we go so, ladies and gentlemen, Gary Plagg. Hey, everybody. How are you? Hi, Gary. Don't even really answer that question. You'll we'll, we'll bog down the internet. <laughs> Thanks, Eric. Thanks for the chance to come and chat with everybody. It will be far more fun if <clears throat> you guys have lots of questions and I can answer them instead of me just giving you a boring presentation about the performance category. How many of I want to ask how many, but hopefully, if uh, since this is broadcast afterwards as well, hopefully you will go onto the Barbershop Harmony Society's YouTube channel and find the video of the performance category description that four of us did. It was Marty Lovick, Gary Steinkamp, Mark Kettner, and I did it at one of the early morning sessions at Harmony University this past summer, and it goes about 45 minutes, and in there are a bunch of videos that that are, come in context with the slides and what we were talking about, which makes a whole lot of sense. Many, many people, if you haven't seen it, I encourage you to go look at it. I will recover some of those things that are in that, but that it really tells you a lot of things that you need to know. So those of you who are on this call, if you have looked at that already, and you have specific questions about that, go into more depth, that would be the best. But let me just tell you briefly what the performance category is all about. So it used to be called stage presence and interp were the two categories that in 93 were merged together to create presentation. And then in about Oh, I'm guessing probably 2013, maybe even 2010 at that category school, there was a big push to move the category into a sense of relevance. And the thought was that we were, as, as calling it presentation, is that we were still scoring things in our insular barbershop world and accepting things that we did visually and interpretively <clears throat> and even vocally that were that were not transferable into the real world like they went fine for our contests and our performances but they really didn't translate into valuable performances that were engaging uh, and uh, believable and with the general population and, and we're, we're watching more contemporary art things so there's a real focus on on helping to move our presentation category into a more relevant scoring acumen if you will that that fit more into contemporary things so that other people besides barbershoppers could look at our videos look at our performances and enjoy them without having a barbershop, any kind of barbershop training to understand why we did things like we did them. So a lot of the things, and we all know what they are, they were, there were some, we saw quartet A or chorus B that won the contest, and so we saw that they moved their hands a lot, or they, they, we that they they waved around on the stage they were on the on the risers they were constantly moving 
and we thought that was a good thing and we accepted that and then we looked at we looked at contemporary pieces of, of visual art, art like that and performance art and we realized that that's not what they were doing and the people that were really aficionados of more mainstream things didn't understand what we were doing so <clears throat> we we really took a look at that and said you know what I, if, if we were trying to get people to be natural and believable and authentic and we're just creating mimickers people that are seeing something that somebody else did seem to score well so I'll just do that and they were a lot of times taking some of the not so great performance things that they saw and adding them to their own repertoire which then just perpetuated it so there's a real focus on, on moving towards more relevancy and also finding ways to be more authentic so some of the the things in the new vision of the presentation category moving to performance uh, was more of an art of performance kind of vision and the goal in doing that was to help performers engage audiences better any kind of audience not just barbershop audiences and also to help perform performers to understand how to create compelling and engaging performances sometimes they didn't know how to do that and so that was really the focus of this change to what we call performance now and it was wise to change the name as well when there's a name change then things change there's even a thought to to change the badge colors to not green because green was per, was presentation and to make it something else that was found to be unnecessary but it was a thought so there was really uh, really among the leadership of the category was uh, a real effort especially with this past category school to change this thing once and for all from what it used to be to something that's more <coughs> a more inclusive relevant type of art so some of the tenets of more contemporary art performances that we would look at uh, Jeremy Johnson uh, Kelly Clarkson uh, different people from throughout history that have been on recorded history that we would look at and granted a lot of those examples have orchestration which we don't have but we can certainly use a lot of the visual things that they do things like their uh, again their natural and believableness a free and present performance that's not preoccupied with technique so if we look at a lot of performances that that we were uh, exhibiting we would see lots of technique and you could watch how skilled the singing performance was and you would see lots of visual things that that looked like these people were working really really hard to get it technically right but then you walked away from it feeling like well that was technically really good but I don't feel fulfilled from it I, don't, I didn't feel engaged I was engaged at watching that performer work and when we look at more contemporary art we realized that performance art, we realized that, wow, we just want to sit back and, and take it all in and be touched emotionally through the performance. And that sometimes that wasn't possible if things are really technically focused. So uh, we also wanted to, we noticed in some of those performances that the performers are emotionally available. They're, they're really into the lyrics and the story and they're, they're not, they're not, trying to show us what the story is they're actually in the story and they're they're being really authentic and, and engaged within that story and the, when those kind of performances happen we realize that that when those happen for an audience it helps to unlock in the audience past personal experiences that the audience have had the audience has and when things are really technical it doesn't sometimes allow for that so the the these compelling performances have authenticity they have emotional availability they sometimes are just fun and playful um, or they're sincere or they're reverent but there are things that are real human emotions that we can relate to and we see the people on stage doing them so one of the things a statement that we we discovered in in a, in a book that we were all asked to read before category school this year uh, which is a book called acting songs and uh, 
I can give you the names of that stuff, the, the author's name later. But in that book, there was a really, really interesting phrase, and it was, uh, it was real. Our goal was real living in imaginary circumstances. Instead of pretending to be doing this thing, instead to be really living in this imaginary circumstance that we've created through the song, story of the song, or in the in the show that we're in, or whatever. But it's about the performer not pretending anymore, but actually being. So that's the biggest change, and that's what that's what the category when we go to contests is going to be looking for. Is this authentic? Is it is it are the people on the stage living true lives in this imaginary circumstance? So uh, the goal then would be to create an impactful performance doing that, leave a lasting impression on the audience, and the, com the performer is communicating authentic emotions to, uh, to the person or people that he or she is is speaking to or singing to, uh, not necessarily the audience. Uh, that performance may be to an individual, especially if we have a you song, something where, where, where someone is talking to someone else and saying these things, and is that a conversation? And so we're going to look for what kind of things happen in that conversation. We don't ever hear the other person's side. We only hear the performer's side of the conversation, but we can watch the performer and we can see where perhaps the person that that performer is talking to in the story says something and the performer reacts to it. And we see that in, their, in people's faces. So I hope this makes sense to everybody. This is, a, this is the idea behind it, is how to, be as, how to be as authentic and emotionally available as possible. It doesn't have to be a gut-wrenching ballad necessarily. It could be a fun uptune. In, in that case, what is it that you're trying to convey or what is it that you're conveying? And then how effectively are you doing that? And then the, the presentation or performance judges would evaluate that. So, um, so any questions that anybody has about that? I know that as a chorus director, it's probably more difficult than working than a coach working with a quartet because you might have 20 or 30 or 50 or 80 or 100 people and you're trying to get them all to be having the same believable type of experience and I know that that often that's difficult because you as the director are watching people not be engaged and and it's possible that in 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 frustration we just tell people to do things and uh, we tell them to smile here or do this here or do that here and then we just get puppets that do what they're told to do but there's not a whole lot of authenticity behind it um, oftentimes uh, I write on my score sheet MFMS which is moves for moves sake and we see that people are given a move to do and they do it but they don't do it like it matters they just do it on the beat because that's when they're supposed to move their hand there and that would be something that's technically accurate but it may not be believably executed so again we're, we're really focused on having performances that are very authentic and very believable so um, any questions yeah, Gary, it's Bob. I mean, yeah. How do you get, say you're doing a ballad, whatever it is, you know, uh, oh, how I miss you tonight. How do you get 50 or so middle-aged to senior men to open up their heart and show that? I find it so difficult. I mean, I can talk about it, I can get emotional on it because I feel it, but most, from what I see, most, you know, 50, 60, 70 year old men, it's tough for them to let down their guard and let it go emotionally on stage. They just don't want to go there. And like you say, I can tell them what to do, and they'll they'll mimic it as best as they can. But most right. times, it's you know, uh, 
it's tough enough to get them to smile. <laughs> you know, it's, please smile. And, you know, you look at them and it, they're still stone-faced. Right, and we have so many tools today that we can use that we didn't have 20 years ago. We have, we have video that is, that is instantly available. We have the ability to do that with, with, a, with a, a, you know, a phone or a tablet device or even a camera mm -hmm. on a tripod. We have the ability to do that. And I think that this is beyond the, the performance category. This is what I would tell somebody in an evaluation is, uh, and I know, that, I know that chorus directors have this challenge, that's why, as I mentioned it before. And I think that it takes time and I think that you need to you need to explain to people the value of the authentic performance to the audience that's watching it. And when when people, regardless of their age and their upbringing, when they understand, I think that we know what we like when we're in the audience. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that we need to channel, we need to help our chorus members know that a this is that the audience will have a much more much more robust experience if we are able to be authentic with them and then the question is well how can i be authentic i don't even know what i look like right so we're going to do a lot of work now on helping our chorus members to know what they look like when they are singing these words perhaps even know what they look like when they're saying these words in fact know what they look like what they look like when they're saying these words to another person as and and maybe put another person in front of them that and when i say this means it's a lot of work that means it's going to be it's going to be a work in progress for many many months right and and i think when they finally get it as you know because i know i've worked with you before you know that when you get it, it's so rewarding. It is. And I think we're afraid sometimes to be emotional in, in, our, in our art because we're afraid of what might happen. And the place to do that experimentation is, A, in a safe place. So it's critical that you make that area when you're doing that, if that's in the big group or if it's in small groups, or whatever, it's so critical that you make it safe because people have to feel vulnerable in order to be creative. And right. there's no there's no creativity without vulnerability. And if I'm afraid to be vulnerable, then it's not going to happen. So finding a way to make it safe is the best thing. And sometimes I guess we're under schedule constraints that make that a daunting task. But as a coach of that kind of stuff, I, I believe that's the only way to do it is to make it safe for men, especially <clears throat> especially older men, to be willing to take their guard down, take their armor off, and allow themselves to experiment with what being with being creative, and understanding that that creative requires that they be vulnerable. And yeah, the Brene Brown stuff is awesome. Because I thought Eric just flashed it on the screen. It you she talks a lot about that vulnerability and that ability to to be to be creative, um, but you only can be you have to, the only way to be creative is to be is to be vulnerable. So I don't know if that helps you, with, Bob, but it's it's going to take time. Yeah. And it's going to take constant reminders, and it's going to. You have to get out of the mindset of of do this and it'll work. Right. Because that's just a band aid, and we all know what happens to band aids; they fall off after a while. And so it's really about growing that ability to have that emotional availability. And, and some guys might not want to do it, and then they're they're going to figure out a way to fake it until they make it. Yep. And not that I'm a fan of that, but sometimes they have to do that until they've had different experiences that, or until they feel safe, that allows them to start to let that stuff go. But 
it might be worth it even to show the video, the videos that we have in this, in the workshop, uh, in the uh, Harmony University video about this category thing that we did, because those examples really demonstrate it well. And yeah, they were, it, was, it was a great 45 minutes. <laughs> you watched it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so you know those videos, and those were those were put on purpose, and they were carefully chosen so that you could see lots of examples of what we used to do of contemporary art, and then some groups that are highly effective at embracing the contemporary art thing. And uh, so I, I know it's hard, but I, I think that teaching them to fish is is the best way to do it. And and it'll take time. I, I think my biggest I thing with, you know, for most tunes is getting them to buy into the story of the song, of saying you know whatever whatever song it is, whether it's you know whether it's you know little pal or so, being able to buy into the emotion of what what the story is there, and to take it to heart, you know, take it home, read it, make it personal. You know, and then you can work on the artistry of what it means. Absolutely, absolutely, and and doing that by uh, a strategy that I've used in the past, which if the group is willing to do it and they and if they work it, it works great. And that is the next song that you're going to learn as an ensemble. Give them the words first. Do not give them the music. Don't give them the spots. You might play it for them once, hmm. <clears throat> and then they don't hear the music anymore. You give them the, the lyrics for a couple of weeks, and you tell them that uh, in two weeks, if you'd like to come and do your dramatic reading, you're welcome to come, and we'll do that in two weeks, and we'll take volunteers. And you'd be surprised what people will do like the kind of work that they'll do once they embrace this idea. So you get them to understand what's the song about, what's the story, who are you communicating with, why are you communicating with that person, why are you telling the person to do this, <clears throat> how does the person react, do you win the first time that you tell them something? No, because the song would only be a half a minute long. So clearly you're, you're working through some sort of struggle to <coughs> excuse me to uh, to convince the person on the other end of the conversation of something, whatever that is. Is it love? Is it that I love you? Is it please don't leave me? Is it let's go do this because it'll be really fun? What 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 is the conflict that you're that you're trying to solve through this text? So m maybe you give them a little bit of context around it and then have them take it and try stuff and that will begin the process of allowing them to become responsible for their own art does that make sense yeah I like that idea you know you you start to and then you start to create an, a, an environment where where you know let, let's say uh, you know Carl is very is very closed. He's he doesn't say much. He 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 kind. He's very guarded, and you give him some freedom. And Carl comes back two weeks later, and he and you say, okay, when it, who who would like to do their dramatic reading? And Carl raises his hand, and you go, oh great, Carl, come on down. And in your head, you're going, Carl wants to do this first, and Carl does his thing, and it's very creative and it's full of passion and you go wow this is really cool and you start to make it okay to do that instead of <clears throat> I think what we've done in the past is that the director says here's the story here's what the song's about now go memorize the song and what everybody does is they go and play the learning track a million times and they learn to come back and recite the cadence that they've memorized. Instead of living with the text, living with the story, 
living with that conversation, and then learning the music that goes with it. Because then you don't have to go back and retrofit it. Make sense? Makes sense. Absolutely. Like Makes sense. Yeah. Makes so sense. I think that it just takes more time, but it's, I mean, I've seen it be highly effective and it just works when you take the time. And if you don't have enough time to do that, then readjust things so you can start teaching people. And maybe it's just the next new song. You don't go back and reconstruct old stuff because that's really hard. But uh, the book I was telling you about is called Acting Songs by David Brunetti, B-R-U-N-E-T-T-I. Yep, I put, a link. I put a link in the chat for you, uh, Gary. So yeah. guys, in your chat window on part of the GoToMeeting panel, there's a chat window, and there's links to the Acting Songs and the Brene Brown Daring Greatly book. Oh, are they both in there already? Yep, in the chat. Oh, perfect. Yep. Okay. So I would suggest, even if you, just as a director, to get that book and read it. And he has great ideas, and he goes through real songs, some of the songs that we know in, in, our, in our music vocabulary. Why Did I Choose You is a song that I don't think I've heard before, but <clears throat> he goes through and explains all that. So I would, I would definitely try that. But also, once you start to, once it starts to feel safe and people know that they can be creative in this space, and it, what if they get emotional? Let's say it's, if it's a gut, gut-wrenching, uh, tear-jerking ballad. And what if somebody cries in it in the rehearsal? Then guess what? They never have to be afraid of that again, because they what what they were afraid of happened. And okay, so it happened. My hair didn't catch on fire. The world didn't stop ending. Didn't stop spinning. And okay, I know that I can't do this in the middle of a performance. But let me figure out. Let me figure out specifically how I can connect with this every time. Another fatal error that I see groups do in this regard is when they start playing in this world of authenticity and real living in, a, in imaginary circumstances, especially if it's a really uh, an emotionally taxing piece, is to keep doing it over and over and over. And, you know, if, if you really want people to, to give their all to it, then we can't do it more than two or three times in that period of time, and then we got to go do something else and cleanse the palate. But to keep beating on it, it's hard for people to to go ahead and get emotionally connected and do it ten times in a row. Um, that said, when you're working with a section, let's say the we're, the, the leads of we worked with the leads a while, and we have the other three sections are people just standing around while you're working with the lead section, encourage them to become emotionally engaged and just audiate. Don't, don't, say the, don't sing the words. Don't speak the words. Just mouth the words, but in the context of, of how you would be talking to this person while I'm working on this technical thing with the leads, you guys can be practicing the performance aspects of this, and we're not wasting time. I and mean, then once everybody's off the paper and, and you've gone through the earlier stuff I talked about, is it's, it's far more effective to fully utilize all the time you have at rehearsal rather than everybody standing around waiting for the leads to be finished being worked with. Does that make sense? Very much. Yeah. Yep. So um, questions for me. So, that, so did I answer your question, Bob? Yes, you did, Gary. As always, thanks. Okay. Are there other ones that come to mind? Seeing no one lighting up their microphone, I'll jump in. This is Eric. Um, Gary, is is your 30-second – hi, I'm Gary Plagg. I'm a presentation judge speech at the beginning of an eval. Is that different now in some way when you're going to give your 30-second – I'm a performance category judge, and this is the performance category – I, 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 believe, I believe that I believe that that the that the presentation category was already here. Okay. And we just changed the name, and we officially said we're going to be looking more at authenticity, and and natural and believable delivery and 
um, you know, powerful storytelling. I believe that we've already been there, but it wasn't clearly stated in the presentation category. And so the performance things were the presentation category was re was edited a bit so that these things, this emotional authenticity, natural believable delivery, vulnerability, powerful storytelling, those kind of things, it's clearly stated in the in the guidelines that that's what we're looking for. So I think that most of, of my judge brothers in the presentation category were already here. And and now I don't think it's a huge change from where we were three years ago or, or six years ago when we decided we needed to be really looking at how to help our performers be more be more relevant, uh, allow themselves to be more emotionally vulnerable, those kinds of things. Because the story just turns out to be way better and the performance is way better when that happens. Mm -hmm. I think we were already there and we're just we're just calling it a new thing so that it <clears throat> with a few tweaks that makes it very clear to everybody what it really is. Good. I I, yeah, I, I agree with that. I wanted to hear it from from someone in the in the trenches too. That, that, that yeah I don't think it's that vastly different. I, I think that <clears throat> You know, you hear a lot of things here. People say, oh, you know, you're going to get hammered for using your hands and you're going to be, this is going to be not rewarded. Blah, blah. We don't reward and we don't penalize. Mm -hmm. We just score holistically based on what is the, what is the impact that this has on us? And is it, what is the, what is the emotional impact that it has on me? And what are these other things? So I, I've, I've been to contests where I just really sit there and take it in. And then in the time I have to write notes, I figure out why am I feeling that way? Like what things did they do that caused me to feel this way? And we're talking about when it's a, a good feeling. Uh, you know, why are my eyes wet? Why, uh, you know, why am I really thinking here about my life? Why am I, why am I laughing hysterically? Why am I... You know what are they what are they doing that's making me do that? And then I write notes on my sheet. But I think that you know we've heard for a long time that <clears throat> that the that the judges are just an extension of the audience. And so I think in the performance category, that's really, really valuable to know because you know the audience the audience knows what makes them laugh hysterically and what makes them weep in their seats. And and they feel things that, and and it's it, I think it's encouraging to know that the judging panel, especially in performance, feels those things as well. And so I think we're just trained, for the most part, to be able to tell if it's is it emotionally authentic or is somebody faking it. And I think that you can tell. I know that I can tell. It might be because of the job that I have, but I can usually tell if it's not authentic, but uh, if you think about it, if you're able to, if you're able to live in the real living, to, to embrace the idea of real living in imaginary circumstances, and you're not too afraid of that, but when you start to embrace that, then your body knows exactly what to do. Your face knows exactly what to do when you're in that and you let yourself just be. And once you start to embrace that idea, it all becomes very easy. It's not <clears throat> this really daunting, difficult thing. It's very easy when you let yourself do it. It just takes some coaxing mm -hmm. and and because you're going to go into a vulnerable space. And yep. that's that's where you have to help your 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 chorus to be able to live in that vulnerable space and that safe area without fear of judgment or ridicule or anything else. Right. So. Other questions from the field? I see you out there lurking. Chris, Russell, talk to me. <laughs> Don't be shy. Go ahead, Bob. Oh, there's Russell. Yeah. Russell, go ahead. Have you ever known me to be shy? <laughs> well, 
I was at Harmony U2. I saw that uh, presentation, which was, was fantastic, and recommended it to the chorus to watch numerous times. My dad, who's in our chorus, has watched it and has also sent emails out to the race saying, you got to see this video. It explains so much. So um, if, if you actually needed more kudos for such a great presentation, you've got them. Oh, well, thanks. Uh, Gary, because they, well, they were terrific. It was just a terrific um, presentation, I thought. And it was only 45 minutes, so we we couldn't get to everything. But you know, I'm happy to answer things. Uh, but the video, I'm glad that you enjoyed it and that it was it was clear about things. But there's lots of stuff we didn't answer because we just didn't have time. But and I think some of the other questions that came out was, which was on the video, was what about stage unique staging, costuming, and things like that. And uh, will the quality of singing still have an impact? And what is the overlap with the other categories? And so those are things that we didn't answer on the video. And I can tell you that, uh, the, for example, the first one is, you know, what about unique staging, costuming, et cetera? Yeah, that just adds to the story and makes it really enjoyable for the audience to just sit there and forget what time it was. An example I like to use is that I went to a Harry Connick Jr. concert at the Kennedy Center one time. And he was just there for two days. And so I, I got tickets because I worked there, and I, and I got some tickets for, as a, as a, you know, for, for being an employee there. And, and I went to the show, and it started at 8.30 in the evening. It's like a Tuesday or a Wednesday. And one of my friends, one of my usher friends, popped in at about 8.20 and said, hey, there's no, uh, there's no intermission in this show. You got to go, so make sure. You, and, and when you leave the concert hall, you can't come back in. You have to stay out. So I went, oh, okay. So we went, ran and took care of business, came back. Things started at 8 30. And it was so engaging for various reasons. And, and I'm so caught up in the whole thing. And suddenly he says, uh, well, it's been great to be here in Washington. And I love coming here, and thanks for coming out and seeing our show, and I, I hope to see you the next time I'm in town. And I looked at my watch, and it was five minutes of 11. And it had gone for two and a half hours with no break. And I thought, this is crazy. <laughs> like, like what? that's engaging. You know, that's just an engaging show that went for two and a half hours with no intermission and I didn't even know what time it was. And I think that's what, that's, that's just a real key to what we can do. You know, just in our, in our brief six to eight minutes that we have on stage is for the audience to not even realize that six to eight minutes went by because they're so captivated by what's going on in the story and in the music and in the, in the musical artistry of it. So does that make sense? Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, another question was: Will the quality of singing still have an impact? Absolutely. And the the thing about that though is that we want to we want to know that the singing is awesome. We don't want to watch you work at the singing and making it awesome. It's kind of like we just like the sausage. We don't want to know how you made it. And it's. The same thing when somebody's a really when it's great music, and it's great and it's really really good singing, really great singing. It, maybe it's virtuous, it's virtuoso singing. Who knows? But we don't want to know how they do it. We just want to enjoy the fact that they do it so well. And sometimes our some of our really great performers, we see all the work behind it. And I, I think that a, a normal audience would say, yeah, it takes. It just takes something away from my joy of of experiencing the performance because and the singing because I watched the performer work so hard to sing. And but the quality of singing is absolutely still going to have a, an impact. And it might be, however, that really phenomenal singing will need to have really phenomenal musicianship and, and musical artistry and really phenomenal performance skills in order for it to be scored as highly as the performer would like it to be. 
it, it may not be able to stand on its own without the other aspects of that performance and, and musicianship being in there at a high level as well. Uh, I don't know if that, I guess that makes sense. So, to still be striving for really great singing, but it needs to have, it, it, will, be, it will be even more impactful if it has the breadth of performance and musicality that goes with it. That sense of that, that artistry that we're looking for, it will be even more overwhelming for uh, as far as the performance art. And the last one was what is the overlap of the other categories? Well, that's what I've just been explaining. That is that that we're all looking for artistry in what we do. If that's vocal production artistry, vocal artistry, musical artistry, and performance artistry, then we're looking for that as much as possible. And that will just be a more rewarding experience for the audience, and it should, in the scoring world, be scored appropriately. You're right. I, I, I always enjoy watching someone like Mike Slamka sing. He's never working, but you're always just so connected with him when he opens his mouth on stage, right? Yeah, and you're going to hear great stuff. You're yeah. going to hear artistic phrasing, and you're going to hear... Yeah, yeah. You know, you uh, you're really gonna like the experience that you have because it's artistic, and yeah, yeah. Gary, what are some uh, some other uh, tools in your in your toolkit, if you will, of uh, sort of like what Bob was uh, uh, getting at earlier when you're coaching as a director, the 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 Alpha male. I mean, you 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 teach uh, uh, police officers how to be public speakers, right? Or at least you used to when you were when you lived in, in yeah yeah, yeah. Area, right? yeah. So yeah, I mean, that's sort of, that's something you do on a, almost almost a daily basis is helping people uh, who are 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 sort of walled up by by profession, right? Sort of break through that and be more vulnerable. What are some ways for us as directors to help guys on the risers? Uh, uh, break down some of those walls and be a little more vulnerable. The, the first thing that I do with all of my non-singing clients is uh, they have an assessment with me. They come in, we spend about 15 minutes of them presenting something that they had for work or some, but a, but a presentation that they have, and uh, and I video record it, and then I don't make any comments, and I have I sit down with them and I we watch it together. And I ask them to make two columns on a piece of paper. One is, uh, uh, I heard somebody describe it as glows and grows. Uh, he's a, a school teacher, and, and he uses that term. And the students have to identify areas that are really glowing and areas that could grow. And so I ask my clients the same kind of thing. You know, make a list of, here we go, on one side, things that you really like about the performance and on the other side things that you think could be more effective and we watch the video and they write those things themselves and then I sit with them and we we go over that together and I I ask them to explain we go over the the things they liked first and then I have them explain why they liked them and then we go over the things they thought could be more effective and they explain those and then I give my two cents and at that point they see what other people see, and then they're far more able to accept the the feedback that other people that see them will give them, because now they're invested. Now now they've done the work themselves, and and they can't the the video doesn't lie, and uh, then they may if it's in a safe place, they're they're willing they're probably willing to to say yeah you know I don't do this as well as I'd like. And I feel like I did that pretty well, but I don't feel like I do this part very well at all. And I really need some help with that. Okay, well let's get you some help with that. And and maybe the 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 director isn't the guy to do it, isn't the the person to do it. Maybe you have a team of trusted people that uh, that you know can handle people well. So that's something that I do with my clients is I work with them individually and show them what they look like and that seems to open the doors for for possibilities instead of me just telling them what they're doing wrong mm -hmm. 
which I know having been in courses and stuff that sometimes you're just told what you're doing wrong and you know but that would be one tool is is to to get everybody aware of what he or she looks like when they're when they're performing does that help you it does it does so there's um, one yeah um, I, I think that another thing that uh, sometimes if you want to try something before you actually show them themselves or have them do it themselves is to is to take a, but I would do this personally with maybe one or two people and look at a performance of an, of a quartet or a chorus probably quartets easier a quartet of some that's not from your district that, and it isn't necessarily a famous international top ten quartet, but a quartet that's just <clears throat> pretty good. You know, maybe it makes it to international, but doesn't come in the top twenty, and, and the guys wouldn't know who they were, maybe. And show them the video and say, "What do you like about it?" And then ask them what things, if you were coaching them, could be more effective. And give them, empower them give them the tools to start becoming more discerning themselves. And then once you've earned that trust doing it with a third party, then maybe have them watch the, you, know, you stick two videos on the chorus. If you got, I don't know, 20 guys, you got one, one video cameras on the, on the 10 on the left side and the other video cameras on the 10 on the right side. And you video record one of your songs <clears throat> from a couple weeks ago and you schedule them, you know, people to come and meet with you and, you know, sit down with them and go through and say, hey, here, here's your part of the course. Here's you, here you are. I want you to watch yourself and, and let me know what things you like about your performance and what things you think could be more effective. And let's watch it together and make, make your list. So you could do that too. Cool. The whole, the whole idea, though, is to make it safe. That's what's wrong with – not wrong, but – Hmm. That's that's where that's where we guys struggle is because it's not safe. Yeah, exactly. And so making it safe is critical to anyone who who wants to affect change. That's why when I work with with people in the police department and the sheriff's office, is the one thing they always told me was that more than any other instructors at the academy was that I made it safe. I made it safe for them to try things that they were uncomfortable doing. And so that's the key to get, I guess that answer goes back to answer Bob's question from before. That's the thing that gets people to be willing to take their armor off is if they feel like it's safe. I agree. I to totally agree. The, uh, what was I going to say? The, the, the easier path for us as directors, I find a lot of times is, to tell them what to do, right? To to raise your arm right. like this, or to smile here, okay. or not smile here, okay. or this is this is the sad part. So don't smile here, right? Um, and that's easy to do. We can we can put that on a list and we can recite it at, at rehearsal and it can be done, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And that they may even mimic it back, but that's not what we're going for. Yeah, it's the big thing, Eric. They may. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. How many times do they? Mm -hmm. And when they do that, they're just reciting a cadence they've memorized. It's not coming from any kind of of authentic place. Right. Right. And and that's where we get in trouble because then we give them another song, and we're and we have to redo the whole thing again, and tell them what to do. And then they freak out when they go to a contest or they have a concert. There's so much stress involved because they're afraid they're going to forget. Mm. I don't remember what I'm supposed to do here. Well, you know, if you're having a conversation with someone and you understand that this is the context of that conversation, as I said before, your body knows exactly what to do. You don't have to remember anything. Right. I remember Judge Judy saying one time, which I love this line, she's, when she's got somebody who's trying to make up the story to fit what they think she wants to hear, and she'll say, she'll say, stop, stop. She goes, if you tell the truth, you don't have to have a good memory. <laughs> you just tell the truth, and that's, that's so, awesome. It's so fitting for what we do, 
you know, that if you just tell the truth about you living authentically in this made-up situation, this imaginary circumstance, you know what to do. Almost every one of us would, would look the same if we had to tell someone, if we were trying to convince someone that we loved them and they weren't believing us. We would look the same. We would probably all look nearly the same. But we don't. So that's that's just my thought is that the, the, the way to do that is to is to get people to be able to live, to actually live as themselves in this situation. And that's what the guy talks about in the acting book, in the acting songs book cool. as well. I'll have to pick that one up, put that on my yep. Amazon list. Yeah. So, uh, well, hopefully that helps everybody with where we are, where the performance category is, and some ideas about how to how to move in that direction with your ensemble. I think so. It, it, will, it will be challenging for some, like really challenging for some. Sure. For some actors to to embrace that, but um, yeah. I don't think it matters where you come from. I guess some people are more hard baked than others, depending on where they are in the country. But uh, but then we have issues internationally as well, where where you know most of us that are out coaching around the world are coaching the, exactly the same thing, and trying to get people who come from cultures that are very reserved and and stuff, and and helping them to to feel like it's safe for them to be them. Mm. So I don't think we have a unique problem here in the in the U.S. and Canada. I think we have <clears throat> we have a global safety issue. <laughs> right. So. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Anything else? When are you coming to uh, back up to the northeast again? <laughs> when are you going to be in town, Gary? What's that? When are you going to be in town? Bob wants oh, to know. Uh, so he I can, no so he there, can schedule, but... so he can schedule not being here. So when, when you're in town. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you guys want me to come up, I'm happy to come up. <laughs> we would love to have you. Up. You yeah. could multi-schedule me so that I'm seeing more than one group, and then it's easier that way. But Eric, yeah, I think that. Um, I, yeah, yeah. So I don't have any plans to come up there, but just let me know and we can work something out. Cool. Okay. That'd be great. One other thing I just wanted to throw in, just as far as our, as, as being a director, it really sort of uh, puts more emphasis on, or as it should be, on starting your score preparation with the lyric of the song. I mean, uh, how many of us as directors take a take a new chart and only read the the poem and the text first? But uh, out of habit, you know, we're looking for chords, we're looking for range, we're looking for notes, we're looking for rhythms. But how many of us have sat there and read the poem through and and just looked at that from a score prep uh, standpoint? First of all, um, I think w would help us as directors uh, perhaps come over to this come over to the to this new way, if you will. Uh, as far as that concerned, uh, thoughts on that? Anybody? I was going to throw in here really quick that I on this in this book, this uh, acting songs book. I just went to this. I think it's the, the second chapter. It's called the monologue. He says the first step I suggest is to work on the lyric of the song as a monologue without any concern for the melody or rhythm. We'll add those later. It's a good idea to have someone play through the music of the song initially for you, so that you'll know the basic feel of the piece, and this in turn will affect the decisions you'll make along the way. But then, set the music aside, write out the lyrics as if they were simply a speech, then proceed to get the monologue on its feet. And uh, a little thing here from a music director who says, I find it strange that a lot of performers don't look at the text as text when they're singing a song. Sometimes they won't even know what a word will mean. And I think that there are some very basic things like making sure that you connect thoughts, even if there's a rest in the music, that you think of what is the sentence 
what is the phrase logically not just musically so uh, along those lines I just just as as, as sort of a proof I guess mm -hmm. that 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 I guess it's chapter three that this is a, an idea that I had this before I read the book but as I was reading this book I was going wow this is good I, I, I've been telling people this this is this is good. Someone who actually knows what he's talking about is telling me that it's good as well. Mm -hmm. So that's good. <laughs> you, just, you stumble on that kind of stuff and you go, why is this so hard for people? And then you yeah. figure out, well, it's hard for people because they don't know how to do it or yeah. whatever. And then, so, yeah. Anyway, go ahead. I'll throw that in. That's great. No, that's exactly what I'm I'm talking about. You know, as, as directors, we, we need to put those things a little more higher in our in our priority, if not first. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. Well, that's great. Any any parting thoughts from the from the the hinterlands of Canada or or Maine out there in, in the wild blue yonder that uh, you guys would like to throw in? Gary, I'll never forget the first time you judged us <laughs> and your thought, and I've kept it with me all all of my career here, is that you said when we got into the uh, to the A and R said, the only thing you watched about me through both of my first two tunes was my feet and how they never moved once <laughs> until, we, until the end of the song and I came back again. And, he said, and you said, your legs must be so darn cramped by, by the end of those two tunes. <laughs> you know what? I've kept that with me all of my days and I, I preach it to all the quartets and, and the guys that I see and I've never stopped moving since then. <laughs> Oh, good. Yep. It is effective moving. That's good. Yep. yep. Yeah, and it is. It's, you know, I've never felt like I did that very first time out there of, you know, plant my feet down and see them nailed to the floor and, you know, and you got me to move, you know. When, when you had us moving, you couldn't stop for a measure in, in the quartet session, you know. And sure. And that, that was one of the best, you know, not not to blow smoke for you, you know, but that was one of the best sessions I've ever, I've ever had. When oh, I first that's nice. Society. Cool. Good to know. Yep. You've done good, my friend. <laughs> cool. Thanks. Russell's trying to speak. No, I'm just ready to if I need to. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> no, really just uh, thanks, Gary. I actually took a class from you at Harmony U a few years back, and... Uh, it was a great class on performing, and I still remember a bunch of stuff from that as well. But uh, no, all I want, want to say is uh, thanks, Gary, for all uh, you've told us and everything. And as always, thank you, Eric, for arranging these things and hosting them because they're they're very valuable to not just me, I'm sure many directors in our district. I'm very glad. You're very welcome. I agree. Here, here. Well, Gary, it's been great to have you. Good to hear your voice. Yeah, well, thanks uh, for having me on. You I betcha. appreciate it. You betcha. And if you guys want to reach out to Gary, there's his email on the screen there. Uh, or feel free to reach out to me and we'll put you in touch. Okay, we'll uh, see you at the next one. I uh, hope to see you at Districts coming up soon in Portland. Right, Chris? And uh, have a great time. And everybody take care. Ciao. Okay, thanks, Eric. Thank you, Beth.